Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and we're taking a look today at the Samsung Galaxy Book Pro 360. This is a very thin and light 15-inch 2-in-1 that will convert into a tablet if you flip things over. And we're going to be taking a closer look at this and its pen in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in on loan from Intel. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. Now the price point on this will vary based on configuration. The unit they sent us to review has an i7 1165G7 processor from Intel. It has 16 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte of storage, and this will run about $1,500. This is kind of the top end configuration. So I think you can get in the door uh, for just over $1,000 on this model and see performance similar uh, to what we're going to get here. Now you can upgrade the storage on it, but you cannot upgrade the RAM. So the memory you choose when you buy it is what you're going to be stuck with. Uh, the model we're looking at today is running Windows 10, although the newer models that are out now will run Windows 11. If the one you buy has 10 on board, it can be upgraded to Windows 11. Now the display on this one is 15.6 inches. It is an AMOLED display, meaning it has a really nice contrast ratio. It looks great. It's very thin as you can see here because AMOLED displays are illuminated by the pixels themselves without the need for a separate backlight. So it's very thin. You get a nice metal casing around it here. It's just a really nicely a constructed laptop. And of course, because this is a, a two-in-one, once my screen comes back up here, uh, it is a touch display. So you can, of course, interact with your fingers or, as we'll see later, use the pen to write notes or draw pictures on it. Now, the brightness on this, though, comes in at just under 300 nits. So you will find laptops priced at or around this one that will have brighter displays, although this one might look a little better because it is an OLED and not an LED-based display. This is running at 1080p at a 16 by 9 ratio. At 15.6 inches, you do start to see some of the pixels on the screen, so I would have liked to have seen a 1440p or something just slightly higher resolution. But again, uh, the contrast ratio and the quality of the OLED here does make up for some of those shortcomings. Now, while we have seen OLED displays running at high frame rates, this one is running at 60 hertz. What really surprised me about this laptop is how thin and light it is for a 15 inch device. It is not much thicker than a USB type C port as you can see here. It's made out of metal. It weighs 3.06 pounds or 1.4 kilograms. Even when you have it in its tablet mode, it doesn't feel as heavy and just ungainly like some other two-in-ones tend to feel. So it was really impressive to see them get the weight down here yet not sacrificing any performance uh, in getting it to that target weight. And I was very pleased with the keyboard on this one. You've got very large and well-spaced keys on this. It is backlit as well. And they even managed to get a number pad crammed in here on the side, although some of the uh, controls are in a different place than what you might be accustomed to on a traditional number pad. And even though this is a very thin case, you've got decent key travel on it. So overall, very comfortable to type on, not something that takes time to get used to when you first get going with it. It's got a very large click pad here as well. It tracks very nicely. It'll click pretty much as high as you can see here. So you've got a good range of use out of it. And overall, the input on this device feels really nice. The port selection is a little strange though. So on the left-hand side here, we have a USB Type-C port, and then we have a Thunderbolt 4 port. This is the only Thunderbolt port on the device, yet as you'll see when we flip it around here, you do have another USB-C port on this side. I would have liked to have seen three Thunderbolt 4 ports, but unfortunately the only Thunderbolt port is this one right here. And it's hard to see the label on the blue version, although there are different colors of this laptop that might be easier to see that Thunderbolt icon. The good news is, is that all of these USB-C ports, the Thunderbolt and the USB-C, all are full service. So you can use any of them for power along with video output. And of course, they'll support uh, data devices too. But the Thunderbolt devices will only work at their full potential out of this port right here. On the other side here, we also have an SD card reader for micro SD cards. And you have a headphone jack for 
plugging in a headset and microphone. Now the webcam on this one is only 720p. As you can see, it doesn't look all that great, but it's probably going to be adequate for doing Zoom calls and that sort of thing. They have this weird thing that'll pop up when you do enable the webcam that will uh, insert some filters and whatnot, including something called Beautiful that tries to make your mouth look different. I wasn't all that crazy about that stuff, and the webcam overall uh, is not going to be its prime feature. It does not support facial recognition for biometrics, but it does have a fingerprint reader that doubles as a power button here in the upper right-hand corner. Now, as far as battery life is concerned, you'll get about nine to 10 hours out of it if you keep the display brightness down and stick to the basics like email and word processing. If you're doing video editing or playing games, that of course will eat into the battery life more significantly. And you could probably squeeze a little bit more power out of the battery by keeping the display brightness down as low as you can get it. It does charge up pretty quick with its included power adapter over USB type C. The speakers are located here on the bottom. They sound really crisp and clear for a uh, downward firing set of speakers. I was really pleased with the audio quality. Not a lot of deep bass out of them, but very clear and crisp. Even when you have it flipped around here in display mode, it still sounds very nice and I'm not getting a lot of distortion even when you rearrange the laptop's orientation. Of course, you can plug headphones in or use Bluetooth headphones to get a sound level or quality that you might prefer. The uh, overall balance of it is pretty nice here as well. As I move the hinge around here, you can see the keyboard largely stays on the desk. And of course, you've got a lot of range of motion to the display here. It doesn't bounce around all that much and overall feels like a very nicely constructed device. Now, although they made this a very thin and light device, I'm not finding many performance compromises here. It actually is performing on par with other i7-based systems from this generation. We'll begin with some web browsing here on the nasa.gov homepage like we usually do. Everything is popping up here very quickly and very responsively as we would expect. This does support Wi-Fi 6, and that is what we are connected to at the moment, a Wi-Fi 6 access point. Uh, but overall, I think for doing the basics like word processing and email and that sort of thing, you're not going to have any issues here. And the touch screen works very well as a means of navigation. And we had no issues with streaming media sources like Netflix or YouTube here. This is a 1080p 60 video running from my YouTube channel, and we're not seeing any drop frames here running it at its full resolution and frame rate. So I think if you're into Twitch or Netflix or whatever, uh, this will do well as a means of consuming media. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 205, and that puts this laptop right on par with other laptops we've looked at over the last year running with this same Intel processor. So let's move on now to the pen. It's not much to look at, but this is actually one of the nicest pens I've ever used on a Windows laptop. It feels great. My only gripe with it is that there's no place to put it when you're not using it. There's no garage on this or any real spot to dock it. Uh, but there is a magnet on the flat edge of the pen here that you can use to stick it to things that are metal. That would include the back of the display lid if you wanted to do that. But you really do need to keep track of this thing when you're not using it because there is no place to really store it, at least on the laptop itself. But when you write with it, it feels wonderful. It's got a nice resistance on the screen. And that really surprised me because typically these pens feel a bit slippery on these glossy displays. But this one just feels like I'm writing with ink on paper. It doesn't quite have a texture to it, but again, there's a little bit of a resistance so that you feel like there's uh, something going on between the pen and the display. And it really helps, I think, for more accurate drawings and writing. It does detect uh, pressure as well. Uh, just a really good pen, not only for note taking, but for drawing. And that was a nice surprise because many times these pens are kind of an afterthought on these two-in-ones, but this one really feels nice. Very low latency and just a really nice experience with this pen. All right, let's move on now to some gaming. We're gonna start with Red Dead Redemption 2, and we saw a performance on this very similar to other i7 processors from this generation with those Intel Evo graphics. We're getting about 30 frames per second, give or take, depending on the complexity of the scene, but that's very good if you are looking for a playable experience on something that isn't that heavy to walk around with. So 
Uh, great performance here as we would expect out of this current generation of Intel processors. Again, just keep the settings down at their lowest level. We also ran Fortnite at 1080p. Uh, this one we cranked up a little bit just to see what we could do with image quality. So we found medium settings to kind of be the sweet spot. We were getting between uh, 35 and 45 frames per second, give or take. A couple of lag hits here or there as things were uh, getting uh, loaded in, but generally a very playable experience. And of course, if we turn things down to their lowest settings, we could get about 60 FPS out of this, which again is in line with other uh, Intel processors running with this Evo onboard graphics. We also ran the Witcher 3 at 1080p lowest settings, and here we were getting roughly 45 frames per second most of the time. Very, very playable, and once again on par with the other i7 based machines from this generation running with the Intel Evo graphics. So you can play a lot of AAA titles on this. Uh, you're not going to get the full 60 FPS at 1080p, but if you turn it down to 720p, you can push a lot of those games to that level or very close to it. And it's really cool that we can play these types of games now on machines that we're not really playing those kinds of games before. So it's really fun to see how uh, these onboard GPUs have evolved over the last couple of years. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 1,790. And like our other tests, this one is coming right in line with what we would expect out of one of these 11th generation Intel processors. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a failing grade of 86%. That indicates that this will throttle a bit when it's placed under heavy sustained load. So you might see sometimes your game slowing down a little bit or maybe a little dip in frame rate like we were seeing with Fortnite a little while ago. 97% is passing on that test. And to be honest with you, I was not surprised that this failed that stress test because it is so thin and light and it doesn't have room for a very robust cooling system. Uh, that said, it isn't very loud from a fan noise perspective, even when it's placed under heavy load. But of course, that fan is not able to move enough air to prevent it from throttling, although the throttling wasn't all that noticeable to us in testing. But I do think you'll see it uh, when you're playing games over an extended period. So you might want something with a little bit more robust cooling if you are planning to do heavy gameplay with this, but I think for casual gameplay, it will do just fine. All right, one last thing to take a look at now, and that is Linux. We booted up Ubuntu on it, and everything worked just fine. So we had Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and audio. Uh, video, as you can see here, was detected properly. I actually thought Linux looked a little bit better than Windows on this machine. Uh, the touchscreen worked here as well as you can see, and I think if you were looking to play around with alternative operating systems, you can probably uh, get that done on this machine without too many issues getting going with it. And overall, I found this to be a really nicely performing laptop. I really like the build quality here. I like how thin it is, and the display, of course, looks really nice. And even though I was hoping for a slightly higher resolution display, I do think the quality of the OLED here uh, certainly makes up for that. So all in a great general purpose laptop with an excellent pen. And that will do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including gold level supporters, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Thomas Anfang, Jim Tannis, and Handheld Obsession. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.